Like that off. I just can't see Dropbox, the icon to kill Dropbox, but I'm sure it's running in the background. And because I don't use my Mac very much anymore, because the first time you use it, they've got like, it tries to synchronize all your pictures and everything. Mm -hmm. right, so <laughs> it's not running. Yeah, so I can talk notably about iPad now. <laughs> it's sounded a bit broken up, so I'm sure it is running. Maybe not. Maybe I killed it last time. Right. Um, I'll start the recorder off and I'll send the link out. Right. I'll send this link. Yeah, it's sounding very good with the, these. The nice these Ferrari headphones, I must admit. But I was just saying, Gary, I've got some, I've got some Ferrari headphones to review, um, which are very nice. Unfortunately, I've got to send them back, but they're um, they offered me two models: the Scuderia edition or the Lifestyle edition, which is the car brand one. Uh, <laughs> so I said I can't be seen wearing Scuderia headphones. No, definitely not. <laughs> yeah. Let's send the link in. Oh, I even forgot to pay out of paste on my Mac. I need control instead of command. It's been that long. <laughs> right, let's load up the chat room and we're all set. Recorder's going. Gary and Jason, Happy New Year. Indeed. Happy, happy New, New Year. Year to you, Ian, and to you, Gary. Yeah. So our first show of 2013. Wahoo. Well, the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> happy New Year to everyone. Yeah. Uh, happy New Year, everyone, the, uh, that's joining us on the live stream. Um, we we'll normally record 8 o'clock on Tuesdays, but this is 8 o'clock on Wednesday. But I think we'll be forgiven because... Uh, New Year's Day. Oh, I was on. I was on a plane anyway. So, <laughs> uh, but not in Germany. A very nice no. weekend in the Alamann. So, very nice place place to spend uh, New Year. Right. Well, we've got a bit busy show. Uh, plenty to talk about. It's first show of 2013. We can talk about. Uh, we've got CS next week, so we'll talk about that. Uh, I've got the um, scores of the vote for the gadget of the year as well so we can talk about that and, and we've got some plenty of news stories as well so we'll do the um we'll do the i'll do the uh, votes as we're as we're going through so uh first we'll just start off so how was uh, how was your christmas and new year then jace how did you go yeah it was uh <clears throat> it was very good thank you very much and um, very relaxing um lots of nice christmas dinners um and uh arrival of an ipad mini Oh, you finally, you finally got one. Yes, yeah. Well, uh, I think I mentioned on the last show that my my wife had won one um, in a competition. Um, so that they said they'd try and get it to us before Christmas, and indeed it, it arrived about two or three days before. Or so, so I've been having a bit of a use of that. Yeah. Oh, well, that's. And what, what do you think then? What's your sort of impressions of it? Yeah, it's um, it's the iPad Mini, like I say. So it's seven inches, um, and I really like the form factor. I must admit, I mean, it's a beautifully light device. Um, you know, it's a real pleasure to use. It almost kind of almost makes me wish that the surface could transform sometimes down to a seven inch. But I, I know it wouldn't. It just wouldn't work as a creation device in that way. But but now, I mean, you know, it's quality Apple product. Um, really like it. Um, to be honest, I'm kind of struggling to to really um, make any real judgment on it because because it's really we've we've kind of decided it's going to be the kids tablet to use because they use ipads at school so they know it and they've got all apps that they want to use on it and so i've not put any of my personal details into it and that's really where i kind of find it falling down compared to the windows environment and particularly with the, the surface and windows 8 that you know there isn't user profiles and also um you know trying to get music onto the device and um, it's obviously quite frustrating um, you know, you can't just plug in a USB flash drive and copy music across. 
No, it's very, it's, yeah, it's iTunes or, or iTunes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so on the one, on the one hand, completely impressed with the device, really, really like it, especially like, say how it feels in the hand. Um, but I've already kind of started hitting those little frustrations with trying to get music and stuff onto it that the kids can, can listen to. So yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of win, wins and losses with me, really. You, you need to do a post on why it's not the, the right device for you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's interesting you found that because I found it, the Nexus 7 is, is the even better form factor. And, uh, and I do wish that uh, sometimes it would be nice if the Surface did, did, did that form factor as well. But, yeah, uh, I think it's just, in the moment, it's just too... The compromises that it would cause would be too much to bear for the Surface, uh, whereas it's fine on a on a tablet like the um, on the iPad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I've read, I don't, I don't think the Surface is that much heavier than a, than a, a full-size iPad, but just something about the iPad mini, I don't think it's just the size, but just the, the, the curve of the device, it's just really nice to hold. Yeah. I know they made a big thing of the Surface about it being designed to be held and, and with the um, kind of the way the edges are kind of gradient in at the back, but I still find it a little bit of an uncomfortable device to hold particularly trying to use it in bed and i keep forgetting i completely forget to use it in portrait mode just because it sits so naturally in in um, landscape mode whereas i think the ipad because it's with the the button being in the in the portrait position it's kind of more natural to hold it that way mm. yeah i know what you mean but it's it's funny as how um how it's turned into such a mainstream device that the friend the friends that we were staying with aren't um you know, particularly tech savvy, just a normal sort of family, and they've got a few kids, and they've got three, three iPads, and an Apple TV, and uh, you know, all happily moving away. The fact that they've no PC in the house, um, so it just shows really how, how mainstream consumer products they really are, and and and, and test of how easy they are to use. The fact that there's no computer in the house because they can't, they don't really get all, you know, they use them at work, and that's enough for them. And but they've got their iPads. Yeah, I mean, we certainly find that the PC is getting used less and less. Um, I mean, I get the I get the Windows Family Safety reports through from from the kids using the PC and and using the Iconia. Um, and interestingly enough, the seven days over Christmas, both reports were completely empty because they've just mm. been exclusively using the iPad. Which, on the one hand, is good for them, but for me, kind of makes me slightly nervous because they're not being controlled by that safety net um, mm. with the iPad. Um, but certainly, I think I even tweeted this to say that. It's been really nice having the iPad to play around with because it's it's re reaffirmed my belief that returning the iPad I purchased was the right thing to do for me. It's still yeah. you know, it's lovely to have an iPad in the house and it's nice to be able to find all the different media center apps and you know you, you it's when you see apps advertised for the iPad you know you can download them and give them a try and have a play around with. But still for me the Surface is is a, is a better device overall. Although the biggest impact for me using the ipad is just just how to use a microsoft phrase how fast and fluid it is because it because you know it, it really does switch so seamlessly between applications yeah it does work well um and we'll talk more about the surface as well because i did a post about that over over christmas so oh you gary so uh, any new gadgets to play with that you you're usually the king of winning things I haven't won anything for a while yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a, I, I spent most of the Christmas New Year writing apps, actually. <laughs> I got oh, yes, yeah, which I got to play with? You got yes, to play with one of them, yeah. And you, do, yeah. you haven't played with the second one yet, so... Uh, <laughs> which was remarkably like the first one, with just different data. <laughs> so so I basically took up a... I, was, I had a challenge given to me to write two apps before um, the 31st of uh, December, so I decided to take up take it up and manage to do it. So um, I, there's a couple of things up there. Bobby, which is basically your local police data, um, so you can see all your crime stats, your local area. Um, and a, so a remarkably similar looking app, which is Food, food Safety UK, which tells you all the food data, um, food, food ratings for local establishments, which is quite scary, actually, when you start looking at it. Oh, that, <laughs> Look at your local that, cafe, that's cafe. more handy than the police one, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's updated on a daily basis. So they're basically very similar concepts that use the, um, the Bing Maps control to, to, sh to show you the information. And then um, when you centre the map on a certain location, it goes off and gets uh, the data from both in, in the, the Bobby case, the, the police API, and in the food safety one, the um, Food Standards Agency API, uh, which are both public APIs. Um, a few challenges involved. I had to had to do some 
optimization to get them to work um, reasonably well on ARM because obviously pulling back lots of data and updating lots of points on the map um, is a is a bit challenging for, for a little ARM processor. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know what your experiences were with it. I know I, I do know some of your feedback anyway because I know Jason gave me some very good feedback which led yeah. to some changes. Yeah, I just <laughs> yeah. I have to I have to say how uh, brilliant Windows 8 developers are at uh, incorporating feedback into their applications. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how quickly was it? <laughs> <laughs> It's quite quick to do. It's Christmas. <laughs> yeah, but I think probably have the same feedback as Jason. I sent that I sent to you is it, it, it was okay. Then you still you've got quite a bit of data, and then it was kind of slow to pan around. Yeah. So so I added a bit to lay to clear data out, and also looked at some overlapping data points and and filtered those out in the feed. So it wasn't actually adding sort of trying to overwrite points it already had and things like that but but on non-arm devices i really didn't have to worry about any of that it was performing well enough anyway yeah. it's just really on on the arm devices had to do that um it's still sluggish in flu places on arm but i'm still looking at potential uh, places but i, I mean, it's good fun i mean i implemented an app bar which jason suggested which is a very good idea but i'd already integrated the um, search contract into it which is, so you can search by postcode which is quite fun um so yes yeah, so it's quite quite good fun to write them and uh, i must have created some sort of world record with the with the original release of bob because it took me seven hours from the time i started writing it to the time it got certified and was published <laughs> in the store <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> It's interesting how you mentioned the contract search because um, I saw a tweet which I retweeted over the Christmas period with someone saying that apps like the Wikipedia app had been given a really low score because there's no search. And I think that really kind of underscores the discoverability of your Windows 8 because you've actually got the universal search, which it, when you learn how to use it, it's great because for the first time ever in Windows, you, or, or sorry, not completely for the first time in Windows, but it kind of, you can literally search be with independently of open the application and you can kind of do search app as opposed to doing app then search i think i think from a developer point of view as well there's, there's, a, there's some issues with discoverability of problems because uh, uh, one of the reviews i had on, on bobby said i really liked a lot i concept this app but it's crashing a lot on me for me and i i, I have not had a single crash report on it so uh, and it's very difficult to get that information back from someone to see why it's gone because i'd love to sort that out for that person so it, it isn't crashing um i can't think why it would do but but Obviously, there's a problem. I'd like to sort it out, and like, and you'd expect to get some sort of crash report back if something was going like that. You'd actually expect to get something back through the Windows Store, but there's nothing reported at all. It's mm. just 100% perfect in the Windows Store. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. So, but yeah, you're right. You're totally right about the search contracts. It's it's totally undiscoverable unless you know it's there. Um, I mean, I think people just don't know about charms yet. I think they will. I think it'll become much more obvious to people. But uh, yeah, like, I think. I think I think it really needs Windows 8 keyboards because with the Surface keyboard, obviously you've got the charms button straight on the keyboard, and I think that's what it that's what it needs. I, th I think often as well with it's it's so simple you you kind of overlook it uh, because I was yeah. noticed someone at work today had a new brought you know everybody buys the home machine to bring them in for us to sort them out, and they brought a, a netbook in with Windows 8 on. Uh, the Aspire one actually worked really well Windows 8, um, but they said they couldn't find the ad remove programs. But all you've got to do is press start and type "add remove programs" or "programs and features." It's called, isn't it? and yeah. uh, you know it's it's there. But you've got to click on the yeah. on the settings one, and you know they couldn't find it. And I think that's pretty. But once they discovered it, then you know they're they're fine with that. Yeah, yeah, it's um, and it's really a doddle to program. You just say you want the contract to put the put the the, the links in. So. And it's fairly standard code to do it, so it's not a difficult thing to, for people to code, code into their apps. So uh, um, I'd like to see, see search and and, and quick uh, access um, coded in more. But yeah, you're right. So discoverability, it's 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 one of these things about whether it's easy to learn or easy to discover. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so some things are, are more difficult to actually discover, but can once you've learned them, you've learned them for good. Whereas um, sometimes things are are very easy to discover. It's discover, but they become frustrating because you always have to go down the same route to find them. <laughs> Trying to yeah. think of a good example of that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but once you've um, dis discovered the search, then you kind of it's in your brain then for for everything else, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I'm, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure with search whether it's actually or with the charms in general whether the gesture with the mouse is actually the easiest way to find them. The easy. The the most intuitive thing to use, and it's whereas the, obviously with touch, it's quite easy to drag from the right. Um, I mean, I know you can use keyboard shortcuts, which is probably one of the better ways of doing it. But uh... 
Yeah, I noticed um because uh, James Mantamagno from Seaton, um, he responded to me and said, yeah, that's why I include a search on the app bar. Um, and yep. he's actually toggled it as an option, kind of display search on that bar as yep. a way to have it on by default. And then as people get more familiar, they can turn it off, which, you know, it's it, it's a compromise, but it seemed, seemed like a fair one to me. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I've got totally used to it now. And um, like, I, like I said earlier, I, I've, I've put a post up about why I really like the Surface and uh, or why it's the device for me. And I, I took it away with me on Saturday. Um, and... You know, I was visiting family and friends, so it wasn't really that I was on it all day, but I would have sort of 10 minutes, even half an hour on it, and then go do something else. And maybe in the morning when I have a coffee, have another half an hour, and then do something else, and half an hour later on or whatever. And I didn't charge it up at all. I did take the charger with me, but I, w- I didn't really need to. So in, in the, you know, that is what I really like about it. And the, and the way that Windows 8 works as a touchscreen, and then you can flip it around, and you can use it as a, as a laptop. It, it all just gelled really nice for me, and that's... Uh, you can sort of, I'll include a link in the show notes so you can see the sort of thoughts on that. Good stuff. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's all the... Uh, so no, no new gadgets here. I think I've got enough enough to play with. <laughs> yeah, I, I decided no gadgets no gadgets for Christmas this year. It's sort of more conventional stuff for once. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Although I do... Um, I am planning to get a new TV because I've had my TV for quite a few years and uh, I've been looking at some of the, the Samsung smart TVs and whatever but uh, CES next week I might uh, might wait till I come back and uh, although what you see at CES takes another year to come out anyway so probably the stuff that's available now is the stuff that I saw last, last year. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll come back to CES later. So the first thing I want to mention is uh, Media Center Guide Data Issues. Mm, yes, something close maybe, to my heart. Yes, if maybe the maybe the Mayans were right, as someone posted. Yeah. Now, <laughs> if if uh, Mr. Sinofsky thought that no one was using Media Center, he's clearly not been uh, looking at the EPG data usage because I've I think you know I've seen so many posts uh, or hits to the posts that I've done on this by people going on Google and searching for UK e- Media Center EPG problems. So I can see uh, you know a, ma- a big increasing traffic so there's definitely a lot of users out there suffering uh, so Jace, um start off for you just explain to us what the problem is sure I, although i did have a slightly different theory i think it was actually that steve sanofsky used to manually capture the epg data and was <laughs> no longer there <laughs> um yeah i, I I'd noticed um, in the run up to Christmas because I, I was we were going through and scheduling quite a few things to record over the Christmas period, and I, and I was flicking through and I noticed that um, as it got nearer and nearer to Christmas, there were less and less things scheduled to record because when you go into view scheduled, it actually tells you how many programs and how many hours of, of TV you've got set mm. up, which can can be slightly daunting. Um, I mean, it was getting less and less and to the point of a few days before um, New Year, it, it was kind of down to about. There were a handful of things to record, and that got me looking. And I noticed that the last thing scheduled to record was was all the New Year's Eve stuff. Um, so I looked a bit deeper and went into the um, information about the guide. And it says, you know, last entry was I think about four thirty a.m. on the first of Jan, twenty thirteen. Um, and lo and behold, yep, yeah, no more no more guide data. Which initially kind of thought, yeah, you know. We've seen that happen before, I know, in the US. Um, so I hope that it might get resolved in time. But unfortunately, here we are on the 2nd of January. And if you're relying on Media Center EPG, um, you've got no data and therefore no scheduled TV shows, which I'm sure is a is a massive <laughs> hit on the wife acceptance factor. D- definitely, yeah. Um, I, I got some data over the air. So uh, I noticed my... Because I, 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 when you mentioned it, I looked my guide, thought, oh, there's data in there. But... It stopped on sort of seven days uh, beyond, so I think it was like it didn't show anything beyond the fourth of Jan- January because it had pulled down the, the 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 days before that through the over the air stuff. But that's very hit and miss because it re- it really depends on you receiving some data, doesn't it? To sort of actually being tuned into a channel to pull the data down. Yeah, um, and obviously with the over-the-air EPG, it's limited to seven days, which sometimes you see TV shows advertised that start, you know, over a week a week away, and it's nice to be able to just set them up um, there. And then with the 14-day downloaded guide, and also I think the over-the-air stuff, obviously with limited bandwidth, doesn't necessarily contain all the information as as detailed as as the media centre guide does. Mm. I mean, um, 
Hey, Gary, is this a, is it affecting all UK users, or is it just the? Uh, do you know if it's just the free view stuff? I think it seems to be affecting uh, most channels. I, I couldn't find some of the cable channels stuff on there. Not using it at the moment, but uh, certainly couldn't see some of the Virgin channels information on there either. So I think it's a general problem. Um, I did hear some of the people were finding some SD channels were updating, but not all of them. Some SD channels weren't, weren't and it's, it seems a general confusion. But we've had this before. I mean, yeah. it's not just the states of this. We've had this in the UK before, and it took ages to sort it out and work out what, what was going on. Um, I suspect it's not renewed contracts. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, we've seen. So I forgot about it. <laughs> I was seeing quite a few people say, well, maybe Microsoft just decided not to bother with it. But uh, the fact that Media Center is now a paid option, for, or will be as of yeah. next week or whatever, is yeah. a paid option in Windows 8, that you've actually had to fork out extra for the functionality. It shouldn't shouldn't just be dropped without some warning. And I, it's, it can't be a, a, a business decision. It's got to be a technical issue, I think, you know, like, or a contract that's expired and they just need to sort it out. Yeah, and probably nobody's left in Microsoft who remembers the contract existed or something. <laughs> That's what happens too often these days. Yeah. But uh, now, um, obviously, there's work workarounds and things you can do. There's there's quite a good supply of um, UK guide data out there for free. So if you if you've got one, some of that you can use some of the XML packaging stuff to get it in, or you, something like a big screen EPG would let you get it in. Um, yeah. Early. So there are ways of getting guide data in, which I've 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 used a couple few the paid guide data services in the past because I prefer the, the data quality but uh, um, obviously it needs fixing and some and uh, I, mean, I get the impression that that um, people are now starting to work on it or trying to solve the issue um, no seat got involved in this very kindly since they've got no UK users um, to try and sort, sort it out um, but uh, I think it's, it's, it's a challenge yeah I mean, Rich says in the chat room um, perhaps Microsoft are going to drop it but I don't think they they will and i don't think they should either i think it's a an advertised feature it, it, they've not uh, they've, if they'd said windows 8 uh, you know during the windows 8 beta period if they'd said um we're gonna we're gonna stop supporting a uh, uh, downloading epg and you only get seven days over the air and they said that six months ago then fair enough but you can't just sort of drop a feature because a contract's run out and you don't think anybody's bothered but uh yeah but like yeah. Rich just says, Ed, I remember when the Lynx extender stopped working when someone turned off a server. Yeah, I do remember that. That was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I'm... <laughs> I mean, I know I've seen this EPG issue in the in the US and they managed to solve it within a few days of it actually expiring. I think I think if they were going to get rid of it, I'd expect it to stop working kind of globally. Albeit, obviously, I appreciate the US is a big market, but I think it probably is. It would just be interesting to see whether or not it needs a patch or whether or not it's just a case that... Um, some data on some server isn't isn't working with the year 2013. I, I'm sure, I, it was it, well, it happened in 2011, going into 12, isn't it? It's exactly around this time. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so it's, not, it's nothing new. This has happened yeah. before. It's just how long it takes to get sorted out. So <laughs> we, we should see. But you know, but but certainly, um, I think I've heard from virtually every media centre user in the UK now, and so it just shows. <laughs> in, it, is, it is a product that is well loved. People yeah. are using <laughs> and rely on it. Yeah. yeah, I've heard I've heard from quite a lot of media centre users in Denmark who apparently rely on UK guide data. <laughs> oh yeah, just say as well. Um, I spoke to a couple of people in Ireland who said theirs ran out in the beginning of December, uh, and they've oh, no wow. and and they weren't getting over their updates either. So basically, that just makes media centre useless, useless. For, yeah. as a DVR. I will say one thing though. Um, it is another plug for um, DVB Link because. For me, I didn't need to go into each channel and reconfigure it. I just changed it in in DVB Link um, setup and applied cr switched on which I normally have switched off, but switched on the um, over the air scanner on one of the tuners and then just reconfigured the guide configuration and resynced Media Center and lo and behold, it started downloading EPG data. So um, certainly, rather than go into each individual channel through Media Center and reconfiguring each one manually, it was you know a lot easier for me mm. to, to fix. And it would be fairly easy for you to pull down uh, data using DVLink and XML uh, data. Um, I'm trying to think of the source that I used, XML TV. You know, you could use one of those, or you could use DigiGuide, or you, you, there are other options if you're a DVLink user. Yes, although the, although each kind of has its has its compromises. For example, the the um, DigiGuide loader doesn't pick up the fact that the plus one channels are repeats. Right. So if you set up something to record, let's say, oh terrible example but let's say coronation street on itv it will also record it on itv1 because it doesn't know it's the same program yeah 
and so there are compromises whereas i think with the um using the inbuilt scanner um oberon did actually program it in so it does actually pick up it's not perfect but it does try to match up programs on on plus one channels and flag them as the same um same program yeah yeah like you said there are compromises i seem to remember gary you once had it quite working work quite using the sky epg data yeah but then there's, there's all sorts of ways of doing it you can um but and, this uh, is so i was gonna say this, this is for stuff for us techies that like messing about with these things not just a, a nice simple media sense system that most people have yes indeed and it's way too complicated for most people i mean i actually recommend people use over the air as well as the media center guide data anyway on freeview um, yeah because it actually gives you better guide data sometimes than you get on the, the especially with new channels coming on and um, and some of the transient channels they, they seem to be um the ones which are only on for certain hours of the day they, they seem to sometimes get much better data over the air than they do think but you're right quite right that's challenging because you obviously aren't scanning those over the air channels all the time although that's actually again where um DVB logic actually you know, comes in really quite handy because you can do the over the air scanning on multiple channels with its mm. sort of type timed scan thing it's got built into it so you you don't necessarily have to be watching a channel to get the data right yeah so um anyway we'll we'll keep posted on that uh both gary and i have spoke to our contacts at microsoft and uh we've been chasing it up so as soon as we hear anything we'll let you know uh, yeah, we'll keep chasing we'll keep yeah, trying yeah <laughs> talking of um your contacts at microsoft, are you guys first of january mvp renewals or are you october october yeah october yeah okay um okay so uh we'll talk windows phone in a minute just a couple of other stories i want to squeeze in before we do that um my movies for android has been updated to 1.92 um so my, my movies on android this version has some book fixes and things but it also re-indexed all your collection so if you're going to use that it has to sort of re-download this, some of the data so uh give that a try uh, we mentioned DVB Link, and they've released the DVB Link TV server for Netgear Ready NAS for the X86 model, so you can get Netgear uh, running your Netgear box running as a TV server. Uh, they're doing quite a lot of work with the, the um, devices like that, uh, the NAS boxes. So I think it's quite a good, uh, quite a good setup that if you uh, if you're one of the you uses one of those devices. Go on, someone can jump in. No, I was just saying, no, you just reminded me, actually, I still need to upgrade my DVB link to 4.5.2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could try and get rid of some of those mirrors you get. Well, probably not <laughs> any errors at the moment, because you've got no guide data to change. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah, there was a new version of DVB link for the Boxy Box as well, since we last talked. Um, so, um, it's a brand new client, so... Definitely, if you're a box user, then uh, if you've got a boxy box, definitely uh, give that a try. And there was also DB Link for Synology NAS as well. So lots of uh, options on the uh, on the uh, DB Link. So good work yeah. from from those. I think they they got some more stuff coming as well. Some good stuff coming. Yeah, I actually heard, how, many, heard, how many developers do they have right? Actively working. To to... <laughs> so go on, go on, Jay. I say, how many developers do they have actively working on the product? I don't know, actually. Very good question. I'll have to ask uh, Pavla. Because they seem to do a tremendous job. I mean, they're forever knocking out the releases of new products. And, and yeah. you know, I think they're, for all the um, play ready issues, they're, you know, which isn't directly their fault, you know, their quality is pretty high. I, I, yeah. I very rarely have any, any bugs as such. Yeah, no, they work hard. They work hard, and I don't think there's actually that many of them. If you if you saw the pictures they posted in their office, they look pretty tiny. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that I spoke to someone who was using the Synology NAS client for old well, server for DBV Logic, and uh, was raving on about how good it was. So very solid product, and he was using it with um, over the air ATCSC in the states. So that's quite interesting to see as well. Yeah, that's yeah. It's good. Um, I think it's a good. It's a good way of sort of reusing a box that. You know, some some that is probably on all the time. Get it, get some tuners kicked up to it, and uh, you know you can make good use out of it. Then, all right. Some other uh, pieces of news from just over the, the Christmas period since we last um, last talk. JC mentioned seen uh, they've updated their um, Echo Extender. 
which addresses some early uh, adopter issues, things like uh, 1080i playback and native resolution as well for the device. So if you've got one of those Seton uh, boxes, then uh, definitely get that uh, updated. And when we talked uh, before Christmas and last show, we talked about the uh, there was an update for some of the some of the apps, the Microsoft apps, and I think we were saying we wish there was a uh, wish there was one that for the mail and the calendar one, and uh, that came out just as we recorded. Yes, yeah, I saw that, and um, it, it does seem to have a, a a few performance tweaks. I know there was some misunderstanding about the about the yeah. release notes, which unfortunately they I think they just left the old ones in there. Um, but certainly uh, uh, completely non-scientific. It does seem to be a bit bit quicker. Yeah, I think the the people app seemed to be better of, of the than previous. I couldn't really see the mail app. The the messaging thread seems to be. I don't know. It just seemed to be look better. I don't know whether, like you said, it was just. Uh, it works a lot better as well. Um, it, it, there was always this issue that you, you've got really disassociated threads getting threaded together. Yeah, that was what just, I had. Yeah. Just by base because it was all based on subject matter and really didn't actually do threading properly. And this actually seems to do threading a lot better in yeah. most most cases. I still get a few odd things, but uh, most cases it doesn't associate things together. I, I used to get I can't remember what it was I used to get, but it was actually mess, one of the messages that Ian used to send send me occasionally. Used to get associated with some really strange spam just because <laughs> it had similar things in the title. <laughs> <laughs> I should stop sending you those vague emails. Then. <laughs> it's true indeed. <laughs> okay, I'll knock them on the. I think the only bug that hasn't been fixed, I, I, I did actually send them direct, some direct feedback through the app, but still was a bit disappointed to see that um, it still shows people's Skype handles as their Twitter names when you you in tweets through the People app. Right. Like when I so, when I look at you, Ian, I see your twi- your sorry your Skype username as as the at instead of your actual Twitter name because right. the first time I saw it, I thought you'd change your Twitter handle, but right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit odd that. Yeah, it's a bit of a bit of an odd one. Hopefully, hopefully, it might get fixed next time. Uh, good comment from Richard when I said when we said about contacting uh, contacts at Media Center about at Microsoft about Media Center, and he said, "And your contact said Media what? Is that the on the Xbox?" <laughs> <laughs> That's almost exactly what. No. <laughs> it's, not, it's not got not forgotten yet. No, not forgotten it's yet. been rebranded, isn't it? Isn't, isn't it now Xbox Media Center? <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, from PC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only premium feature that you pay for in Windows 8, actually, I suppose, isn't it? As part of, yeah. if you want to get the Pro Edition, that the media sense is the only premium feature that you could possibly buy, and it doesn't work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, uh, some other stuff from um, over the week: XBMC. <coughs> Excuse me. XBMC 12 Frodo release candidate 2. So it must be getting close to the final release of XBMC. Yeah. And, and that always triggers a raft of... Um, you get Open Elec and you get RasBMC and all the other sort of Ras, the XBMC builds for our, uh, various platforms all get updated to uh, include the latest one as well. It's a bit like the domino effect. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah, Open Elec... Uh, version three beta six and all this other stuff you'll get all the, all these including the latest ones so um i hope to get hoped over christmas to spend some time with uh, xbmc and get do some more uh, tv setup stuff with it but uh, I, I, for some reason i got absolutely zero time and not done anything but uh, i'll keep trying I'll keep trying to get some time and uh, other um app news vlc kickstarter funds got it uh, reached its funding target uh with a few days to spare as well and, and a bit over so it looks like that's going to be going ahead the vlc project for windows 8 and they also said that uh some the extra money is going to mean that they can work on a windows phone 8 app as well and share some code between them so uh when vlc as a windows store app will really open up um the potential if it can play um it, it, if it's like the desktop one where it can just play just about anything without having to transcode it, so I think that'll be great. And it'll be it's good on the um, on the on the Android, and it would be nice to see it on Windows Phone as well because it would really add uh, a lot of media capability to the uh, to the, to the Windows Phone where you're, you're currently converting a lot of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know how feasible it is, but you know, if VLC could support BD Center files, then that'd be a no-brainer for me in terms of purchasing that. 
Yeah, definitely. I I don't know what model they're going to operate, but to, to, I think they raised over forty thousand anyway f- uh, for that uh, project, and they're getting help from Microsoft as well. Good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to uh, look at the device of the year in a sec. Just a couple of things I want to mention. I did a couple of impression posts. Um, I put my impressions of the Nexus Four. I don't know if they had that last time we talked. You're about to get it, I think. Yeah. So um, yeah, I've got the Nexus 4 on here, and I have to say, I really like it. Um, the form factor is is really nice. It's um, I haven't used the, the um, HTC 8X. So I really like the small, slightly smaller phone than the um, the Note because you can actually use it with one hand, which is which is quite handy. Um, so I really like the small size, and I really like the Android room without any overlays on it as on the Nexus 7. So really, it's just the same as the Nexus 7, but in the phone. So you've got things like Google Now and, um, and other stuff on there. So really like it, and um, yeah, I've been using it quite a lot. Battery life is about the same as the 8, uh, the 8X, so you get a full day, no problem. I always charge overnight anyway. Um, but as I've described in my post about uh, why the, really the Windows Phone wasn't for me, after having used the Windows Phone, uh, I've just got some noise on the line. I just wait for the noise on the line to, but I can see it's my heating starting up. Oh, there we go. <laughs> you need to have some sort of noise filter on that heating. Yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm, <laughs> It's it's. I've even gone through a filter block and all sorts. It picks it up. It's yeah. something to do. The mixer picks it up. Anyway, so <laughs> um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't used Windows Phone 8 for a month or so before switching across. I do feel like I've kind of gone back home with the Android and that I've got things that I've been missing. Um, I've actually got you know back again. So the podcast apps and uh, the sat nav apps and. Um, you know some of the other stuff as well. So I really, it really just suit Google Music and everything else. So I really do like the ATX. Sorry, the um, the Nexus Four. So if you're looking for an Android phone, I'd say very a good choice. There's a couple of limitations on things like there's no space for SD card, which I miss, and so 16 gig, and then you're full. There's no swappable battery. So you can't carry a spare battery, but I, th- I guess you don't really need to do that nowadays anyway. Uh, but it's also nice, nice to have. Um, but overall, anyway, the, my kind of ideal phone I think would be something like the ATX, but with the with Android. And I think Android just works better for me. And I think as JC put on the comments, for some people, someone like you, the um, Windows Phone works best for you. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I've always said that, you know, my um, app needs are relatively limited. You know, I'm not a big app user. I, I probably went a bit berserk when I first got my Windows phone, but that's primarily trying stuff that, that was released into the store as opposed to me going to look for, for solutions to specific problems. But, yeah, I mean, I, I just tend to use the core functionality because I'm in the Microsoft ecosystem. Um, but I thought your piece was really, really good, really well written, um, and I completely sympathise with, with where you're coming from. Yeah, and it's funny that... As I, as I put, so why the Surface is the right device for me, the compromises on the Surface are very similar to a Windows phone, but somehow I can live with them on the Surface, um, perhaps because if you've got something like the Nexus, I have no compromises on the phone. So I can, it, it, it's a bit of a contradiction. To, I'm sort of contradicting myself in some respects between the two posts, but I find I can just that you know it works for me having that. So um, that compromise, I can manage it on the surface and on the phone. I just you know I couldn't manage it. So I'm gonna I'll keep the ATX because I still like Windows Phone. In fact, I've got my other SIM card in there, so I do still use it. Um, but uh, I think I would have been better with the 920 um, because of the the Drive app and things like that. Um, but Anyway, so post link for those in the show notes and why I like the Surface and and why um the other the Android sort of works better for me. You have got to say though that it's certainly close. You know, the, you you could get away with you know you could use one or the other. Yeah, the, the Windows Phone has certainly done a good job catching up. Oh, and just to just to finish that as well, I mentioned in the post that uh, Google Music was an issue, that I, I'm a big fan of Google Music, and you couldn't get that on Windows Phone, but you can now, uh, an app called Cloud Music, and it works really well, actually. You can 
have offline music and you can listen to your music stored in Google Cloud and you can pin it and you can pin it and cache it. Uh, so it's quite a nice app if you're into Google Music. Yeah, I just, I mean, t you know, totally tip my hat to, to third party developers. You know, they do a lot, particularly on the Windows phone platform. Um, but it always kind of makes me, I always kind of have a preference to, to not using third party apps just purely because about sharing credentials now. Mm. You know, it's okay with things that do the um, the the um, AAuth and things like Twitter, but you know, when you actually having to enter, say, for example, your Amazon logon credentials, it kind of makes me a little bit nervous. Yeah. Um, and obviously, appreciate that the app stores are curated, but you know, you only need one app to slip through, and people harvesting logon details and just uh, just worries me greatly. But I think you know, Windows Phone's biggest enemy at the moment is it it needs that. It needs to move the beyond the third party developers. It needs when you're walking past shops that have the download download our iPad app or our iP um, phone app. You know, it needs to include Android as it often does, but also Windows Phone. I think that that's the next level, really. I think the devices are there. It just needs the app ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's it. You do see everywhere you go now. You see the Android and the I iPhone logo for the for the store apps or whatever, um, but you you just don't see Windows Phone at all. No. I think I think Microsoft couldn't couldn't do much worse than just hiring a lot of the, the top third party developers and saying, you know, hiring them out to companies. Yeah, just a marketing sort of exercise. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm up for that. Because <laughs> <laughs> when you can totally understand that companies, you know, they they're going to go where the where the where the market share is, and that's understandable. Whereas if Microsoft needs to approach these people and say, look, you know, it won't cost you anything, but let us let us work with you and develop those apps yeah yeah absolutely and then, and then give them the source code yeah yeah it's a way of uh, of promoting it out so uh, i'll link to those posts that i did anyway in the in the show notes right now it's we had all the votes are in the votes are in the phone lines are closed don't vote as you uh, may still be charged <laughs> we're not charging are we that's yeah. um, we missed a trick there actually <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, you're, if you're listening on plus one don't vote <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um yes yeah, so we had a, a recap with a couple of uh well a month ago now we put the i asked for nominations of what your gadget of 2012 was and so i got quite a lot of nominations for different products i put them into the vote page and then i put the vote page up uh, a week or so later so i think that's been up for over a month now so um i had lots of votes so we'll, we'll have a quick we can have a quick chat about some of the devices as well just before we we go to things so uh the nominations were the raspberry pi uh, not a lot we can say about that really it hasn't been said already a phenomenal success uh, considering the sort of a year ago it didn't exist and now it's one of the most talked about devices for, um, uh, and uh, certainly generates a lot of buzz and uh, yeah I've got a couple now so Gary we still need to get you on one of those so you can get it yeah. that's the one, probably the one gadget I would have accepted as a Christmas present <laughs> but I did get one didn't get one so I did I did have to laugh though I, I, I overheard this kid talking in one of, one of the shops and he he was saying to his, uh, his I think it was his aunt Dad, Daddy got me a raspberry crumble for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> I bet they sold loads, didn't they, over Christmas to yeah, for, for did, dads yeah. buying their kids' ones. Yeah, dads buying. Their yeah, kids ones, yeah. Yes. <laughs> the kids, kids go. Well, I would have possibly want one of these. Yeah. Um, anyway, we had the uh, iPad was nominated. The iPad Mini, which Jason is already the fan of. Uh, the Nexus Seven, the Surface. Which obviously, I'm a fan of uh, the Nexus 10, the Kindle Fire, Lumia 920, the Galaxy Note 2, iPhone 5, S3, uh, the eight, Samsung Galaxy S3, and the 8X. Um, so, I'll give you a quick re uh, oh, I'll tell you who was last, see if you can guess what goes through. Well, I'll give you a quick guess. So, which product got the least votes? Ooh. Silence. Silence. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not Windows Phone. Fine. No. <laughs> it was it, in joint last place was the Kindle Fire and the ATX. Oh, yeah. That surprised me. The Fire. I mean, yeah. My sister obviously didn't vote. That's uh, she loves her Fire. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it, actually, I actually know a friend that got a Kindle Fire for Christmas, and he he really loves it. Yeah. So the Kindle Fire and the ATX only got one vote each. 
Um, the next device up was the uh, Galaxy Note 2, which um, has been a good seller. I'm surprised you didn't get more votes, but I guess it's a fairly new device and um, it, it's a second generation product, so it's not re- sort of revolutionary or anything, but uh, still um, a couple of votes. The next one after that was the Nexus 10, which I'm not surprised really. I, I, the Nexus 7 where it, it um, you know, was was cheap and that was one of the main selling features. The 10 was re- not quite as cheap. and uh, um, So that, that only got a sort of a handful of votes. The next though that was, was surprising was the um, iPhone 5 and the third generation and fourth generation iPad. We got the same amount of votes as well. So only got eight votes each. That's interesting. Yeah, I guess I wonder if that's you know people just not upgrading. Yeah. Uh, the next up on that was the Lumia 920. Um, sorry. Yeah, actually, sorry, that was just one place ahead of the iPad Mini. Mm-hmm. So Lumia 920 got more votes than the iPad Mini. And I can generally say that wasn't my vote. <laughs> yes, they all came from your same IP address. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, next after that. Oh, now we're going into the top four now. Oh, top three. Okay, top three. I, I don't know if we could do this in Alan Freeman. Your big top ten, not half. Not half. <laughs> <laughs> so at, number, <laughs> uh, at number three, it was the Nexus 7. Uh, a device I've got and really like, actually. I used quite a bit over the, over the weekend. And um, nice form factor and a cheap price as well. And... Uh, I think they must have sold a lot of those over over Christmas. At two. <laughs> yeah, at two. And in second place, it's the Surface. Uh, and then at number one, with a massive, uh, I think it was over 80% of the vote, was the Raspberry Pi. <laughs> that's, where, that's where my vote went. Yes, I have to say, and, uh, and mine is a much a love of Surface. I thought, no, that's... That really has got to be the device of the year, just from the amount of potential that it's got, the price, and uh, and you know, getting and all the things we talked about all year, getting kids into it and everything else. But it makes a great media center as well. Um, I think I think, I think it's it, Sky Data. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that the, also the Raspberry Pi uh, community is very strong as well, and a couple of tweets from the Raspberry Pi uh, Twitter account uh, really d- definitely helped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i mean like i said i mean i, I haven't got one but um but definitely that's where my vote went i mean i think it's it's a great device it's so versatile and you know it gets kids interested in technology again so definitely yeah, yeah. Uh, rich is not in don't range here linux fans again <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, do you want your site going offside no, no, I, I must admit I, I couldn't bring myself to, to vote for the service as much as i love mine i still feel it's a slightly flawed device in in kind of performance and not i don't think it's quite as as well-rounded as the ipad was when it first launched but maybe you'll you'll disagree with that i don't know no i think if you can live with its limitations it's like i said in the post it's, it's a great device and, mm, and you'll yeah. understand its limitations the, the ipad is, is designed really to do everything it does perfectly and things that it can't do perfectly it just doesn't do uh, whereas I think the Surface is a little bit more flexible. It allows you to do things that perhaps it isn't perfectly designed for, but you can do them anyway. So if you're the kind of person that can work around that, then then you're okay. Um, but it kind of goes back to what I was saying about sort of the formula stay with of the weekend. That we you know, they had all iPads, so they were sat on the sofa with you know their kids with iPads. My kids were there with their iPad, and you know it's it, you know, these devices they just work so great out of the box. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, the 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 iPad is just performance wise, it really is, you know, above the surface. But as I uh, we bought my youngest um, a little Lego MP3 player, and it was just so nice just to be able to plug that into the USB port of the surface and copy over some MP3 files. It was, you know, literally just so yeah. easy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, congratulations to the Raspberry Pi. Not a great shock of, of the year. It uh, the, it beat it it. it it beat the pillow in the, in the voting <laughs> <laughs> my miles, my miles. <laughs> yeah, from a few years ago. I think uh, that was that was always a close one, but you know, it, it even beat the pillow for the vote. So <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still waiting to see those two devices combined with the Raspberry pillow. Uh-huh. No, the Raspberry cool. crumble pillow. <laughs> <laughs> yep, Raspberry crumble pillow. Yeah. 
<laughs> Excellent. So um, anyway, well well done to those, and thanks to everybody that voted. And um, I'll send them a tweet afterwards. But uh, it was I installed some caching software on the on the site as well before I sent them the link. So <laughs> site stayed up quite quite well actually now. So we we survived a couple of Raspberry Pi uh, uh, tweets now. So that's a, that's a good thing. <laughs> no, definitely a well deserved winner. Yeah. Uh, right. So look, let's look forward now to. Next week, it's coming around very quickly. It's CES 2013. Uh, I'll be leaving on Sunday. The show starts, you know, press events on Monday, and then opens on Tuesday. And I'll be there for the week. And uh, as usual, my calendar looks completely uh, crazy. Uh, Gary's seen what it's like when you're over there. It's just oh, indeed. Yeah, well, I'm still seeing it. Even though I'm not going this year, I'm still on the list. So I'm getting tons and tons and tons of uh, emails. So. <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely a lot of uh, a lot of emails, a lot of press releases. So I've got plenty of stuff lined up that uh, probably do quite do some videos and maybe some podcasts as well, and hopefully I'll catch Andrew. Uh, like I said, I'll doorstep him at his hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how how many invites have you had to media centre related events? Um, not that many of them. <laughs> Actually, you're not really going over to CES, are you? You're going over to sort the guide days around. Yeah, I'm going to key in the guide date. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> For the year. <laughs> I guess, I'm guessing the seating guys will be there. Uh, I, th I think so. They were talking about it anyway, so I've, uh, I'll try and catch up with those uh, guys if if uh, if they're around. I've seen you know people like Samsung and uh, lots of lots of uh, some smaller stuff as well. DLNA, we usually see those, so definitely see them again as well. Um, so there'll be there's lots of sort of media center type stuff, but not necessarily Windows Media Center. You know, there's a lot of DLNA and uh, network. I'm sure there'll be a million iPad cases as well. So that's what most <laughs> of the press releases really seem to be. Yeah, and no Microsoft, of course. No, no, this will be the first year since I've been going. I first went in 2006 that uh, there's been no Microsoft, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what effect that has on the show. I suspect none. But what do you, I don't know. What do you think, Gary? Well, I haven't thought you had a key keynote to queue up for for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It might make your life easier. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's quite interesting because you said this every week. It's probably the first the first um, CES since they did home home server where they actually would have had some consumer stuff to show off. Yeah, that's what yeah, exactly. I put it in the in, in my post about it. Yeah, the preview post. This is the best year for them to actually have some consumer stuff and things they're selling directly as well, and they're not there. Yeah. Yeah, odd. But there we go. They made the decision some time ago. I mean, I, I actually applaud the decision. I think 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 um, there was too much emphasis on CES and Microsoft, and uh, it meant they, they didn't always get things out out on the uh, on the doorstep when really they could have done. So I think they could come back, but but not not in quite the style they used to come back. Yeah. They used to be at. I mean, it's the time it's close for the for the uh, Surface Pro, isn't it? It's got to be due any yeah, any yeah. time now. But funny yep. if they showed up, they announced. I mean, that's what happened. It's happened at a few CES, hasn't it? Apple announced the iPhone, I think, at yeah. one, one you, of them where I was there. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of. But yeah, so we're going to be seeing Netgear, Panasonic, DLNA, Cyberlink. Yep. So uh, plenty to, to talk about. I think it's going to be smart TVs again, isn't it? There's going to be the big thing. Yeah, I think smart TVs are the big thing. I think you'll see a lot less 3D. Although you might see some glasses free 3D because there's a few bits been done on that. Um, I think you see a lot of 4K stuff, sort of very high definition televisions. Um, I think that's that's definitely a big market coming forward. Yeah. So I think you'll see that. And a lot. And I'm also getting because just looking at some of the press releases, I was seeing. I think a lot of smart consumer stuff. Um, people like Philips and people like that are coming up with smart consumer technology. Yeah, I think I got one from Whirlpool. I yeah, don't, I don't yeah. want to look at washing machines. <laughs> but yeah, sort of smart fridges, smart food processors, things, things which are actually connect to the internet. Um, so it's quite quite. I, the integrated kitchen someone was talking about the other day. I thought it was quite quite a good idea. I mean, it's been talked about for some time, but the idea that you actually get a recipe online and and it basically um, you just put the, the ingredients in, into the right part of your kitchen when it tells you to, and then it, it controls the, the, the things like the microwave turns on, the food mixer turns on, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> could be fun. Could be, yeah. could be messy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can, I can, yeah, that's just something I can't see yet. But uh, I think we'll see things like um, home automation for power stuff, won't we? a lot of smart meter kind of stuff. Smart fridge is huge in the states. So I think that'll be that'll be on yeah. that'll be there in its numbers and and some some 
Actually, that's was, that was one thing I did have a play with at Christmas. A um, friend got a whole, whole one of those Lightwave RF um, bits of kit, and that was actually quite quite good for turning the Christmas tree on, lights on and off, and <laughs> things like that. So yeah. nothing too too exciting. But uh, I did quite like. I did like the fact they had um, the ability on the on their um, telephone based interface, or the, the, the sorry, telephone internet based <laughs> uh, interface to to um, have uh, the ability to know when dusk and dawn were. From your local area, so you could turn lights right. on off at dusk and turn them back on dawn. That, 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 or the other way around. But that's, that seemed to work quite well. I mean, I, a few years ago, uh, I used to use M Control with the, yep. um, a, an X11 interface to turn my outside lights on and off for the at Christmas. Um, and it stopped working, and then you know, the hardware stopped working. I just have never bothered to replace them. But it would be nice to have everything sort of hooked hooked up and uh, like you said the lights turning on and everything else like that it's just uh, there's always that promise and it's never quite got there i think it's more in the us but uh, not in the uk certainly it's it's taking its yeah. time yeah i think lightwave rf stuff is pretty close but they still need to do quite a bit of work mm. um some of the things i noticed i i put a post here about it actually samsung uh going to be showing off or they showed off last year, and it's actually going to be available this year, the Smart TV Evolution Kit, which is kind of the, their uh, way of addressing the problem where you buy a TV and then the sort of the software is out of date and there's no way of updating it. So I, mean, I, I can't remember seeing this last year, but uh, apparently they announced it last year and they'll be showing it this year, is that they've got this kit that can upgrade a 2012 Smart TV to a 2013 version of it, which I think is a, is a good idea because we've all got sort of used to Things being automatically updated and with the latest versions and yeah, my te- my, I actually worked it out the other day. My television is now on its thirty second t- second firmware update. Great, <laughs> which I think is quite amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you know, I look at my my Sony TV, which is only five years, six years old, something like that. You know, there's there's nothing. There's no concept to smart TV. It's got one HDMI port. Uh, and 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 I got your switches, so I'm going to be probably getting something like a smart TV, as one of the Samsung ones with all the HDMI's, and it's got Angry Birds on it and whatever. But <laughs> <laughs> what, what can't you buy with Angry Birds? Where, where is Angry yeah. Birds now? <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I was playing with one in the in, the, in uh, PC World, and it's got the sort of Connect style interface, but it didn't work very well. It's still so much easier just using the remote. Don't talk about Angry Birds. But I was talking to some, another shopkeeper who said he actually had someone come in and ask if he could they could buy Angry Birds. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he sold, sold them a tablet. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Angry, Angry Birds on the Xbox is very entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> I've been well. That's what. Well, this, actually, this is the critical issue with Windows Phone. Is I've got Angry Birds on the Windows Phone Eight, Star Wars One, and it's still not got the Hoth levels. And yet, the kids have got their Android phones, and, and the Hoth levels are on there in the free version. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Eldis picked up on that on the iPad. <laughs> the fact that the Hoth levels are available. I think, uh, I think the, the issue there potentially is the fact that it's an Xbox game, isn't it? And I think yeah. it takes so long to get those approved. Yeah, so they got their free one. I should say, actually, I know we've got a lot of time left, but um, the kids got new. They wanted phones for Christmas, uh, so I picked up the Samsung Galaxy Mini Two, which is a fairly new phone, and they really like them. And it's amazing to see them just, you know, have no issues getting on with it and playing with it. They've got apps installed, and uh, rather cleverly, sat you can um, you can take it off your page. You go credit when you buy apps as well. So. <laughs> See, uh, <laughs> which is good because you don't have to have a credit card associated with you with your Google Apps account, with, with your Play account. Right. Yeah, so it's good in one way that you know. I, so with the iTunes, you've got to associate a credit card. I don't know if you still got to, but you you did when I when they got their iPods and then they bought vouchers to top it up. But potentially they could still go into my credit card if is limit. Uh, so I had it so that you know I had to prove the stuff before they could buy them. But on Google Play, it will take it directly from your pay as you go balance. And so I know I said, well, there's, there's your balance. It's up to you what you do with it. Whether it, and uh, they've been pretty sensible with it, really, to be honest. But it's at least it's it's the options there if they really want to buy something, then they can, and it'll just take it off their uh, pay as you go t- values. Mm. Yeah, no, that's good. One um, one handy Windows 8 tip, if you go into the store, um, you can actually have the store use a different account username than the, than the actual logon. So it means that if you've got, say, four users of a PC, you only actually need to buy the app once 
um, and then you can download it on those other four users. So it's it, each app purchase can be used on up to five devices, but it's it's um, I think it's unlimited number of users on each device. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, that's... Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. I haven't tried the multi-user stuff on Android because actually because that's on there, but um, it's just not something I've I've tried. I don't let them on it. They've got their own devices now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, so. I'm not sure exactly what the schedule will be next week. Um, next Tuesday, I'll be uh, uh, wandering around the halls with aching feet by now, I'm sure. So we'll definitely have to do something next week. So whether I pre-record something on the interviews and, or uh, we'll try and catch up, it's a bit hard to sort out schedules next week. Best way is to follow me on Twitter and uh, at iStixon and keep up with us at CES. Um, so what's your uh, Twitter address and where can we can find you? I'm at database Chase, and I'm at Gary WMA. And Gary, if you uh, include link for your apps, and I'll stick the links in the show notes. Then. Yep. Okay, I will do that. <laughs> okay, so we should be back to record probably next Tuesday, a week on Tuesday, uh, if I've recovered, which hopefully it should be. But to a shop, we should have some content from CS. You never know who we might bump into there. Um, thanks to everybody in the chat room. Thanks to Rich. Uh, he said he saw some astonishing 4K TVs in Japan, and he'll be saving his penny for, pennies for one of those. So uh, I'll go and check out the 4K TVs. They did look good when I saw them last year. So I'll have a look, have a look at those. That's good. Uh, okay. I'll let well, you, I'll let Jason. I'll let you go back to your uh, uh, iPad Mini. <laughs> if I could, yeah, if I could get my hands on it. <laughs> but yeah, have a have a safe trip. Yep, and we shall yep. see you next week. Somehow. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Cheers. Okay. Bye. Bye. Excellent stuff. Right, I'll uh, stop the...